so there'd just be a hippo that comes in because they're all animals yeah. at the law firm. And the hippo would come in and he'd open the door to Harvey's uh, office and be like, hey, did you get the thing I sent you? Welcome back, creeps. Hey, bachachos. I think we were just saying that it feels like we haven't actually recorded in forever, but I think what happened was we caught up with ourselves mm. and like got a couple of weeks in advance or like at least one week in advance. So it's probably been like two weeks since we actually sat down and recorded. That's true. Yeah. I like that. I think we should do that in like bursts where we record 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 and then just like chill take a break yeah because yeah i'm I'm, like we're less likely to get burned out that way yeah i feel like so this week's patreon shout out is carolan so carolan has been a big supporter of the show for well what feels like forever anyway and she's also sent in a couple of stories to are titillating tales of true terror. So if you've heard her name before or if it seems familiar, that's why. Anyway, this week, just today, we just put out Dulce's first makeup tutorial. Yes. On our Patreon feed because it was requested by a couple of members of Patreon. Really? I thought it was just one. I don't know. I feel like over time it was like at least at least one, but a couple of times people have mentioned it, mm. like maybe in passing or whatever, and I've gone, mm, yeah. okay. But it's something that you've wanted to do for a while, right? This is true. I've been, I wanted to take a stab at it um, because, you know, several things. Because, like, I'm a huge, I've, I've been watching makeup YouTube for, I think, four years. And I, like, watch the trends of them. The kind of videos that are out there. I have my favorites, of course. um, And I've kind of just settled into the people that I watch. But there is like, I feel like lacking there in the in the community. There's like a area of it that's lacking, you know, showing your older products, some love things that you've already bought, because a lot of the videos that I watch is what's the next thing. And oh, my God, it's so good. You need it. You know, they don't out there say you need it, but they hype it up so much that you feel like you need it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Even though they say, like, I'm not saying you should run out and buy it, but oh, my God. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? If I didn't have this right now, I would die. Yeah. You kind of just feel like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a huge reason why I don't veer, like, away from the ones that I like watching because the ones that i like watching are not shoving suggestions down my throat yeah so there's that and that like i said right now that's just on patreon but possibly going forward i guess i'd make my own channel but yeah and then my nieces have been saying that i should do it because i think they just like watching me put on makeup i think for a lot of people it like it's just Something that you can not space out, but like, it's just an easy to watch thing. It's like easy listening, but with your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, I can sit down and like, it doesn't ever bother me when you watch makeup videos. Yeah. Unless like, say the person has a really annoying voice or something. Yeah. But in general, like, I'll sit there and just like, let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm letting this happen to my face. Yeah. Um, to my eyeballs. But yeah, so. Like Dulce just mentioned, we are also thinking about setting up a vlog channel. Yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> we might As, have already mentioned it in passing. Maybe. Um, we've definitely toyed with the idea and now we're just going to actually follow through with it. It's not necessarily like weekly creep related or anything like that. We don't even yeah. have a name for it yet. It's just for people who like us. Yeah. As and people. Also for us to be able to look back on. Yeah, I think that would be cool too. Yeah, 
Um, it kind of came about more seriously the other day when I was uh, going back through footage of me and my little sisters from Christmas. Two years two ago. Two years ago, yeah. Yeah. Just doing dumb shit. And it, but it was nice to be able to kind of go, oh, look at that. And edit it and put it into a nice, neat little video where it's not like fucking four hours of, you know, bullshit and 10 minutes of ha ha ha. So <laughs> we're going to try and I'm saying weekly, but probably not. We're going to keep it loose. <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep it real loose because uh, we have this podcast. And then at, at the same time, I feel like once we get in the mindset of, OK, this is what we're doing. It won't be as, oh, my God, we should have brought the camera because we forgot that we're doing this blog thing. It'll almost be like a second nature thing. Yeah. And like that, it's just because we'll forget. Yeah, we'll forget. We're going to forget as well. We just want it to be a fun thing for us. Yeah. Which is the most important thing. Yeah. Anyway, so I think that's all our news. Yeah. I think if we keep it just for us, then it'll translate. People will enjoy it. Yeah, I'll try and set it up like right after we record this. So I'll jump in here and say, you can actually just search Adam and Dulce on YouTube. This is Adam from the future telling you this. Just search Adam and Dulce. Right now, we just have one video up there, but check it out if you're interested. And, you know, subscribe and all that good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. If you like YouTube, check it out. And like that, one week, it might be like five minutes of us just fucking doing nothing because sometimes we just have boring weeks. Yeah, sometimes we do. And that's fun. I like our boring weeks. <laughs> I like to just have a have a sit. Yeah. So anyway, we don't normally keep talking for this long. To yeah, this is thing. not like us at all. I think we're just excited to record. Yeah. <laughs> this is nice. We went and uh, we actually have two episodes to record right now. Yeah. Sucks for you guys. We're happy. So we're going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I go first this week. All right. Go for it. And believe it or not, I have... Taking a step away from the paranormal. All right. That's kind allowed. It's yeah. our podcast. We I, touch we it, I touch on it. <laughs> but this is mostly a... Is it just a tip? Just a tip, baby. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true crime story. Sick. For the most part. So this is James Urban Rupert. James Herbert Rupert? James Urban Rupert. Okay. So it's actually a pretty cool name. Like if you told me that, like, oh, James Urban sounds like a 1950s actor or something. Oh, yeah, I guess it does. So when you drop the Rupert. Yeah. Oh, Rupert. Rupert. Yeah. Is it a, is this a, an accent thing? No, there's two P's. Oh, it was just really strange. So I was like, because I kept typing Rupert. Yeah. And then had to go back. Oh, and it's Rupert. Rupert. Okay. James. Yeah, James Urban Rupert. Okay. So, born on March 29th, 1934 in Hamilton, Ohio. Okay. To Leonard and Charity Rupert, who were not very nice to him. Okay. This is like almost textbook. It's a common theme, yeah. Yeah, but like so much so, the mom apparently just told him all the time, I wanted a daughter, you were a mistake. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, and... That's almost as bad as saying, hey, kid, you suck. Yeah, it's like, oh, I wanted a different one. You're not the one I wanted. Yeah, I want to return you. Yeah, that's like me Where's coming the out of the shop with a Samsung phone. You can't put the candy back in mom's wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> so, um, needless to say, this like just gave him awful grief from the get-go. From the get-go, not gecko. And also his dad was prone to violence and didn't really give a shit about James or his big brother, Leonard Jr. James was always small and weak. I feel like an ad for like or a true crime snippet right now. Mm. James was always small and weak. Oh, yeah. Like the TV shows? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He had like thick-ass glasses and he developed bad asthma. I don't know whether like... I don't think it's important either. I don't know whether he, this is a new thing or whether he was born with it, but his dad was actually a chicken farmer. <laughs> I swear to God, I thought you were going to stop at chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, this is good. Get all your laughs out now because this story goes south. Um, 
But yeah, he was a chicken farmer, but having asthma and allergy induced asthma, he couldn't help out. Like, yeah, which obviously made his dad fucking resent them. So he did suck. I mean, <laughs> Just I, he was a kid. <laughs> like, if we were to have a kid who <laughs> had thick glasses and had asthma, I would love them just as much as, yeah, you know, the football playing kid. But this family <laughs> obviously didn't. So he was bullied at school as well because of his appearance. Yeah. And because as well, he couldn't participate in like any regular games that the kids were playing because of his asthma. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming this was in a time before inhalers and stuff like that. Yeah. When he was 12, his dad, Leonard Sr., died of tuberculosis. So what year was all this stuff happening? So he was born in 1934. 34, okay. And in 1947, his dad died. He, James was 12 and his big brother, Leonard Jr., was 14. And he took over like as man of the house. Mm. You know, with the dad gone and all. Yeah. The bullying never stopped. And I don't know whether it got worse or maybe just the whole situation got really bad. But after the dad died, both his mom and his brother just seemed to like tag team on him, constantly picking on him. I think the mom would, you know, kind of lead the big brother on. Yeah. Like, you know, provoking him and all this. Like, kind of thing. Yeah. Tell him he sucks. Yeah. 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 He does suck. And he, she would also baby Leonard Jr. Because oh. she he was her pride and joy. Like, it was so bad that at age 16, James went off into the woods to try and hang himself. That's so bad. Yeah. Oh, it sounded like just so fucking sad. Now, oh, just a side note. Inhalers were invented in 1778. Oh, shit. Well, I was wrong. I mean, to be fair, they probably, he <laughs> probably just, didn't have one. Yeah. And those inhalers were actually just lead. <laughs> <laughs> they probably didn't want to buy him one. Suck on this lead pipe. This will do you. Smell this chicken. It'll flare up your allergies. (laughs) (laughs) So like I said, he attempted suicide at 16. Leonard Jr., like I just said, was the golden child in Charity's eyes. Mm -hmm. But not just because she preferred him. Like he was a sportier kid, like did really well on all his football teams and shit. I don't know. He was normal for the time. Yeah, but like excelled. He was the jock, you know what I mean? He was the cooler kid. He also went on to college. He got a degree in electrical engineering, which then got him a really solid job with GE. um, General General Electric. Electric, Which like at the time that those kind of fucking jobs were like. That's like Tesla. Gold mines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's one of those like forever jobs, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I've worked here 83 years. All the while, James, like, never finished high school. Yeah. And flunked out of college after two years. Yeah, I mean, they set him up for failure. Yeah, exactly. And he, like, I, I'm i pretty sure I have the same mentality. Like, if people tell me that I'm not going to do well, I generally just go, oh, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> and just, like, don't try, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he just seemed to fail at, like, every fucking thing that he tried. Uh-huh. By 1975, he had moved back in with his mother, who he owed money to, along with his older brother, because James had lost whatever money he had made. He had invested in the stock market, Mm -hmm. which had a big crash. And I think it was 1973 and 1974, like that Mm -hmm. whole time was just shit for stocks, I guess. And he had also developed a really bad drinking habit. So how old was he when he moved back in? 21. Sorry, no, 41, 41. Oh, okay. Yeah. And like that. And now he had this really bad drinking habit too. So he would spend every night drinking in this local bar called the 19th Hole. Mm -hmm. One thing I will also mention is that absolutely every single article or post I read about this guy said the same thing. He was 5'5", weighed 135 pounds, and was the most boring, unnoticeable, indistinguishable and unremarkable man that ever walked this earth well alcoholics generally are boring people they have no personalities but like looks wise you know what i mean like he just blended in and it was just another thing that like i felt so bad because if people speak like this now Mm -hmm. i'm sure they probably weren't that shy about saying it to his face like you know what i mean or just fucking ignoring him and leaving him out i guess so yeah understandably james suffered from 
like really bad, bad depression. Yeah. And he was spiraling deeper and deeper. I also read that he suffered from uh, like paranoid delusions. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's hmm. OK. Yeah. And the, the first place where I saw oh, and he suffered from paranoia. And I was like, OK, like what? Yeah. Like everybody does to a certain extent. Right. But this guy, like James would actually. He had like intrusive thoughts to the point where he actually thought that his mom and brother were communicating with the FBI oh. about him being gay. And also his brother either loaned him money for a car or bought him the car straight out or gifted it to him or something. It was a Volkswagen. But James was convinced that his big brother had booby trapped him. So strange. Yeah, right. One quote I read stated... And was he gay? I don't think so. Oh, that's so... That's like kind of weirder Yeah. as well. So I think maybe like back then, like, I mean, some people even still today think like that that is the worst thing in the world. Oh, so yeah. maybe this was just. Yeah, that makes and sense. They I'm were like, probably calling him gay since the time he was a kid. That's true. You know, like just to I try. I forgot. And, I'm like, that's so that's a such a specific thing. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, so maybe this was a like a common theme of insults within the household or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, They're constantly yeah. saying. But he, he did have a few girlfriends, mm. not many, but a few. And he also said, and I quote, my mother drove me crazy by always combing my hair, talked to me like I was a baby and tried to make me into a homosexual. So that's a direct quote from. Him. So I don't know that that's. Or maybe it was because she wanted a girl, you dummy. Maybe, yeah, maybe she used to dress him up like Charles Manson's mom, like Henry Lee Lucas's mom, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. All of these other unfortunate people. Anyway, by this time, his mom had like reached the end of her tether with him. He was living in the house, drinking seven nights a week. Fucking the chickens. Fucking the chickens. I think the chickens were gone at this oh. point. But he was also like living off of her money and his brother's mm-hmm. like handouts. So they had like a big falling out and she said... Like, if you can afford to drink seven nights a week, you can afford to pay your own rent. Mm -hmm. I want you out of the house. Like, ASAP. ASAP as possible. So, March 29th, 1975, James followed his usual routine. He went to the gun range. He was a big gun collector. Mm. Now, one source I read said that he went to the gun range. Another source said that there was multiple witnesses that saw him shooting tin cans along the banks of the Miami <laughs> River in Hamilton. Maybe that was the gun range yeah. in Hamilton, Ohio. I don't know. But again, Ohio, not Miami, Florida. <laughs> he then spent the evening drinking at the 19th hole where he had apparently been telling the bartender, Juan the Bishop, all of his mommy troubles. Interesting. Yeah. And Wanda remembered him. Wanda remembered asking him, like, had you solved his problem yet? Meaning, like, this issue that he's having with his mom. Mm -hmm. To which he replied, no, not yet. He stayed at the bar until closing, around 3 a.m. Now, he left at, like, 11 o'clock for a couple of hours. Don't know where. But he came back. And then he moseyed on home. That was his 41st birthday, March 29th. Mm -hmm. The following day, he was rudely awakened at 4 p.m., by Leonard and his family. It was Easter Sunday and Charity had set up Charity is the mom. Uh-huh. Charity had set up an Easter egg hunt for the grandchildren. All eight of them. Jeez. Leonard had eight children. Being such a good, you know, family man, role model and all this. And did I mention that Leonard's wife was actually James's girlfriend originally? Oh, that had to hurt. Yeah. That's so fucked up. So fucked up. And like in my head, the way I'm seeing this, like not to, you know, make uh, James to be the victim or anything like that. But I can imagine the brother solely doing something like that to get at James. I feel like at this point, he probably made James watch them have sex. Yeah, that's the kind of shit. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, around 5 p.m., everybody had come inside from being out in the garden looking for Easter eggs. And Charity was rustling up some Sloppy Joes for the family. Oh, I fucking love Sloppy Joes. Yeah. Now, on Easter Sunday, 
That's kind of weird. Right? Yeah. Don't worry. Because according to the Daily News, her grandchildren had already eaten a more formal Easter dinner with Alma's parents. So Okay, so don't panic. They were oh. well fed and it was Easter. <laughs> <laughs> like that was an actual thing in the fucking That's Easter. That's so ever. strange. And what's a formal Easter dinner? Well, I guess like just like a roast dinner, you know what I mean? Like, well, that's what we would have at Easter. Mm. A roast chicken? Yeah, roast beef, something like that. Something mm. along the lines of a Christmas dinner, you know what I mean? Oh, okay. Except like a lesser affair. Anyway. I'm hungry. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more about this Easter dinner. <laughs> <laughs> What's that gravy? Um, so anyway, Leonard at some point asks James... Remember, James had just come downstairs from sleeping off his hangover. Yeah. He said, how's that Volkswagen? James was outraged. And he stormed off back upstairs. He returned about an hour later, carrying a three fifty seven Magnum, two twenty two pistols, and a rifle. He shot Leonard first. Whoa. And in quick succession, shot Alma, Leonard's wife. His mother, Charity, and Anne, David, and Teresa, who were three of the kids that just happened to be in the kitchen. He then moved into the living room where he met Leonard III. Whether this kid was trying to protect the remaining siblings or whether he was just in the doorway, I don't know, but he was the only one standing. Mm. He was quickly taken down. According to one source, James then sat on the couch and one by one, shot Michael, Tommy, Carol, and John. He then got up and walked from one body to the next, making sure they were dead. In total, By shooting them, I'm assuming. Yeah. In total, he fired 31 shots. Whoa. Three in each victim, bar one. The whole ordeal took less than five minutes. But James waited three hours before finally calling the police to report a shooting. That was his words. I'd like to report a shooting. When police arrived, he was waiting for them just inside the door. According to the police, the only sign that any struggle had gone on Uh was the trash can had been tipped over. But there was so much blood that it was actually leaking through the floorboards and dripping into the basement. That's insane. Is this house still up? No. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. He was charged and eventually convicted of 11 counts of murder. Although there was some like big kerfuffle over a $300,000 inheritance that he would have gotten if his insanity plea had been accepted. Mm-hmm. All the articles went like in pretty in depth into that, but I, I didn't want to get bogged down. He was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences. In 1982, he appealed for a new trial and it was granted. Eventually, he was found guilty of guilty only of murder in the first degree of his mother and brother, mm-hmm. but not of the other nine due to reason of insanity. Mm. They were I th- like I literally read somewhere that they were collateral. Interesting. And for this, he received two consecutive life sentences. He is still alive. What? Yeah, at least as far as I could find out. I couldn't find anything that said he died. And as of December 2019, he was in Franklin Medical Center in in Columbus, Ohio. He's been denied parole twice, but he's actually eligible to apply again in 2025. He'll be 90 then. Wow. Yeah, if he makes it. His 11 victims were buried in Arlington Memorial Gardens in Cincinnati. If you go on, if you're into this kind of thing, you can go on to findagrave.com and you can read all of the headstones. The house where the murders occurred was rented out a year later. Carpets were placed over the bloodstains that they couldn't get out. And when they held an open house, like prior to renting it, like a month or so before renting it, it was supposed to have been an absolute fucking circus. Like all these people showed up to see the murder house, you know? Ah, yeah. All sorts of rumors started circulating as well. So on this day, like when people showed up, there's like reports of, you know, moms with their babies in strollers, like all dolled up, you know, spending the day out, like yeah. men with their cigars standing outside, like just made an absolute show of the place. You yeah. Know? But yeah, all sorts of 
rumors had started circulating. Like, Alma had wanted to commit suicide and take one of her children with her. Right, Alma was... The wife of Leonard yeah. uh, Jr. So this one rumor said that she actually started the whole thing what? by harassing Jimmy James. Yeah, that's one like weird fucking like theory. antagonizing him. Yeah. Oh, so as to he, like set him off. Yeah. So oh. as he would kill them all. Of course, he'd victim blame. Yeah. Another one was Rupert went berserk. When he learned his mother had made hamburger helper for Easter dinner. <laughs> so fucking insane. Yeah. What what I find crazy is that just that one remark set him off. About the Volkswagen. Yeah. So I yeah. thought when he said, how's that Volkswagen? I thought maybe he had crashed it because he was drunk or something. Literally, I couldn't find anything. But that was supposedly. I think as far as I could see, it was the only thing that was said to him. Yeah. Anyway. Um, He's like, again with the Volkswagen. Yeah, the fucking Volkswagen. Another weird fucking rumor was, um, though confined in a mental hospital since the trial, James Ruppert has an extensive wardrobe, loves to eat ice cream, and continues to receive the Wall Street Journal on a daily basis. That was my follow-up question. Like, how is he faring in jail? Like, is he getting help? I would assume so. I would say he's... Like, a lot of these people prison like unfortunately they have to go and do all of this horrendous crime yeah to end up getting looked after the way they should be and i didn't read anything that said he was a troublemaker in prison or anything like that yeah now again i didn't read any books on him Mm. either but i did try and find out so didn't know there was other silly things like kids had snuck into the rupert house on minor avenue and had said everything was covered in blood. Like the whole house. Right? Yeah. And of course, the Rupert house is haunted. Apparently, the people who initially rented the place didn't have any idea what had gone on there and they were very quick to move out. Wow. They claimed they could hear voices, unexplainable noises, lights being turned on and off, loud footsteps, and doors being slammed. I don't know. Like, I can't say whether. Like, 100% that is exactly what happened. Or maybe when this out-of-town family that moved in, like... Started hearing quickly that w- found it was the out, house. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just the social stigma and that, like, oh, yeah, they live in the murder house. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Like, oh, you're new in town. Where, where are you staying? Yeah, exactly. And then they're like, oh. And boom, like that, they're getting cut off. Like, nobody yeah. in church is talking to them anymore. So... After that family, like, there was a long string of families moving in, moving out. None stayed long at all. All of them claimed to have experienced paranormal things. But again, maybe this is just the stigma of living in the murder house. At the time of the murders, it was the biggest mass murder to have ever occurred in the States. Like, specifically... Like, it had some, like, mad title. Like, you know the way, like, Guinness Book of World Records yeah. kind of have weird titles? It was something along the lines of most family members killed in one house in one Holy city. Shit. Like, something like that. There's a new category for it. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, the, the house then sat unoccupied from well, for years. I, don't know, I can't remember the exact fucking years. I want to say, like, 1980 till 1989. Mm-hmm. But nobody actually lived in it then. Yeah. It was eventually bought by a lady called Cinnamon Baker. That is so cute. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know if that's like a pseudonym or not. Um, But she has... Her stripper name. Or maybe, yeah. But, like, she hasn't tried to, like, hide her physical identity. Like, she's been on... She's been interviewed and shit on the news. So Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that, yes, Cinnamon Baker is her actual name. That's so fucking cute. In 2008, she had already bought the house when she actually found out what had happened there. Mm-hmm. She said... They Wouldn't were... it be funny if Cinnamon Baker was like this, this like, goth chick? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Not what you would think she'd yeah, she yeah. be. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, like, a Nintendo character. Like, you know, like, like Cooking uh, Mama or something like that. Oh, yeah. Or, like, uh, what's her name? That little girl from Wreck-It Ralph? Oh, I don't know. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Strawberry shortcake. Somebody. (laughs) (laughs) 
So anyway, she said they were literally just waiting for like one final check. The seller had to fix something in the basement before they finalized their deal. Was it the ghosts? <laughs> yeah, you gotta <laughs> fix this fucking ghost situation. So they had to make one more trip over there and inspect it themselves with their inspector before everything was finalized. Mm-hmm. And she was like, well, we've made it this far and gone through all this process. Like, let's just go over there, check out the house, see how it feels now that we know this. Yeah. And she said, like, it felt fine. There was, like, nothing. It's wrong just with a it. house. Yeah. Yeah. They were, like, super happy with it. They went ahead with the sale. They actually moved in the week of Halloween. Mm-hmm. Like, her first Friday night there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Might have been Halloween night. She said something like that anyway. But they say there has never been any paranormal activity hmm. whatsoever. And neither did the one previous owner. Who owned it for years only because he had such a hard time of fucking selling it. Because every time he would almost seal the deal, he specifically said, that neighbor of mine kept telling people <laughs> and I lost 10 grand. <laughs> One thing that was 100% true, mm. they could never get all of the blood stains off of the floorboards. That's so wild. And uh, Cinnamon only noticed this after she moved in. Now... They're not like on the top, like you're not walking on blood stains. Like they have, you know, laminate floor or whatever flooring in. But it's in the wood. When you go down to the basement and you look back up, oh, there's literally drippings of blood. Shit. Down the thing, and she was like, "Can't ah. you replace that?" I mean, yeah, but it's like supporting beams and stuff like that. I'm sure it's a costly job. Mm. She just said she didn't mind. It's just proof of what actually happened in the house. She's like, "It's just the history of the house." Dude, I'm telling you, she's a goth chick. Blood soaked. She's gotta be goth. She doesn't look it. And like, she has, you know, regular little family and kids and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah, so that's the story of James Urban Ruppert. That's fucking insane. Yeah. And like, the whole family annihilator stories, I've never looked into too many of them. But Mm -hmm. when I started reading that, I was like, oh, this guy, he just kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed. Yeah. This is, yeah. This This is is what what can happen. Yeah, if they don't seek help. Yeah, and like... Which kind of sucks in a way, because it's like, they set him up for failure, right? Oh, yeah. And he has to be the one to seek help, because he's lived the life that you've given him, Yeah, in a sense. He's constantly being told all his life, you're weak, you're a nobody, you're nothing. I know, that's what I'm saying. So then, like, how is he gonna... I know what you're saying, I'm just... Saying like this is the message that's being drilled into him. Exactly, and at the same time, where he's expected to seek help for a problem, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I'm gonna, like I'm gonna. It's like saying I'm gonna take your car, Adam. I'm gonna go crash it, but I expect you to fix it, even though I'm the one that totaled your car. Yeah, and also if you fix it by going to a car therapist, you're gonna be seen as weaker again because yeah, you went to a therapist. Yeah. Go get help, people. Yeah. Go talk to your fucking therapist. Yeah. Even if you feel like there's nothing wrong if with you. If you fucking hate your parents and your brother, go seek help and tell your therapist how yeah, much you hate your parents. get the fuck away from toxic people. Just because they're your family doesn't mean they're not toxic. Exactly. We are not sponsored by BetterHelp, but <laughs> check out BetterHelp. <laughs> so my sources from that story were WCPO.com, Wolfpack. It was like some fucking guy on YouTube. A six pack of wolf. Uh, there's no six pack involved there. Wikipedia, James Rupert's Wikipedia page. Jam Rupert's. Rupert. Rupert. Uh, American Hauntings Inc. or American Haunting Sink. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> dot com. <laughs> uh, NYDailyNews.com and GhostFandom.com. Sick. Yeah. I really like that story. Yeah. It, like, everybody loves the anti hero and stuff. It's so hard to not feel for that guy. Yeah. Like, even though, yeah, he killed. It's very rare for me to... Sympathize with a fucking exactly. murderer. Yeah. It is really hard for me. Like, even the guy that I, I covered, that Cohen guy, the one that looks like Johnny Cash. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, it was... It was hard for me to sympathize with him, even though, like, it was kind of a similar situation. Yeah. Because he was a fucking rapist. Yeah, but all of these stories, no matter how sad the ending, yeah, there's always a sad beginning too. Yeah. Maybe we true. should change fields. Maybe we should just talk about like 
happy things every week. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the vlogs are for. Yeah. All right. Your turn. Right. So my sources are your mom. Oh. oh. Someone's had a dinner. Now she's full of fucking beans. <laughs> I'm full of chick tacks. Chick tack. So trigger warning for self-harm. Today, we're going to be talking about Ms. Karen Greenlee. Okay. All right. I'm going to cite my sources afterwards. Please remind me. She was born in 1956 in Sacramento, California. I couldn't find a lot about how she grew up. But what we do know is that at 22 years old, Greenlee worked as an apprentice embalmer at Memorial Lawn Mortuary. One of her duties while she was working there was to drive the bodies of loved ones to funerals. On December 17, 1979, she drove the company's 1975 Cadillac hearse to a funeral with 33-year-old John McCure in tow. He was dead. Yeah, like it was his funeral. Yeah. That was implied. <laughs> I just wasn't. I want to be clear. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> I just want to be clear that he's not riding shotgun. He is the main event. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm just having visions now. I'm like, <laughs> shit, do I want this for my funeral? <laughs> like, do I want to be sans coffin, bent and put into the... <laughs> Shotgun? Yeah. <laughs> Greenlee impulsively decided that she didn't want to stop to deliver the body to its loved ones upon laying eyes on them outside. The family described seeing her pull up to the funeral home and abruptly do a donut in the lot. What? And took off. The family called the police, and she was found near Allegheny in Sierra County, which is still in California for anyone who's wondering. Okay. Greenlee was taken to the hospital because she was found unconscious but still breathing. She had attempted a suicide by overdosing on 20 Tylenol pills and codeine. She was rushed to the hospital and had her stomach pumped. When she was found, they also discovered a four and a half page written confession that included her admission of having sex with 20 to 40 bodies of young men. Yikes. In this letter, she claimed that she was addicted to doing this. Greenlee was charged with stealing a hearse and interfering with a funeral. She pled guilty and paid her $225 fine and served only 11 days in jail. Necrophilia was not a crime at this time in California. So it's like, what do we charge her with? Yeah, I think it was one of those things that was just kind of not even thought of yeah. to be a crime. It was just like, well, who's going to do it? Yeah. She was given mandatory therapy, which helped her accept herself. Greenlee's and Memorial Lawn Mortuary was sued by the victim's mother for a million dollars on the grounds that the whole ordeal caused her severe emotional stress. Yeah, I can imagine. At the trial, the defense attorney for the mortuary threw some serious shade at the victim's mother by basically saying, in court, I don't know how you can be so stressed when you're too busy being medically depressed and being a raging alcoholic. And then proceeded to dredge up her history of her battling both demons. Fucking hell. Yeah. Like, he didn't say this verbatim, but this yeah, in yeah, layman yeah. terms, yeah. You know how they like to zhuzh words up. Yeah. One of Greenlee's co-workers was called to the stand to testify on what kind of person Greenlee was. He described her as quiet and competent, and he had no reason to suspect that she was fucking corpses. <laughs> the lawsuit was settled for $117,000 in general and punitive damages. Years later, in 1987, Greenlee agreed to an interview with Jim Morton for Apocalypse Culture. So I found the interview. Okay. When this story hit the papers, people had a field day with it. Not just because this was like, I mean, 
it was a woman fucking a corpse, but because she was a woman fucking a, a corpse. Not a guy, yeah. Exactly, because uh, nine out of ten, like nine times out of ten, they're males. Yeah, in fuck any corpses. fucking sexual crime, right? Correct. So Jim Morton was amongst a few others that submitted works to be published in this book called Apocalypse Culture. I haven't read the whole book, but I'm so excited to read it because it <laughs> seems like such a good book. Like, just like, it kind of just seems like Tales from the Crypt, yeah. like a collection of weird stories, like tales, but real life shit. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyways, so let's get to the interview, shall we? Right. Back during the trial, from what I read in the newspapers, it seemed like you got very little support. No, none whatsoever. The newspapers were the worst. To this day, I hate reporters. One of them even compared me to Richard Trenton Chase, the vampire killer. What support there was was like family obligations. One of my brothers refused to have anything to do with me. He said, I just want to remember her as she was. He came up to me later and apologized, but he still isn't comfortable around me. My other brother was more supportive, but even he had to ask, how'd you do it? Before the trial, I had a boyfriend who found out about it. He got mad and slapped me around. He said I wasn't even a woman, and I could go fuck my dead bodies. I was surprised. He knew. Apparently, a lot of people knew. And I don't know how they knew. With guys... They always felt I went for the bodies because I was hard up. And if I went to bed with them, then that would change me and they would be the one who would give me such satisfaction that I wouldn't need those corpses anymore. I've run into that a lot. Sometimes I had guys come on to me for just that reason. The question I am most often asked is, how does she do it? Yes, that's the question. People ask questions like that. Even people who seem pretty cool seem to have open minds. Then when you tell them, they say, that's very interesting. Then don't want to have much to do with me. I don't mind telling people how I do it. It doesn't matter to me. But anyone adept sexually shouldn't have to ask. People have this misconception that there has to be penetration for sexual gratification, which is bull. The most sensitive part of a woman is a front area anyway. And that is what needs to be stimulated. Besides, there are different aspects of sexual expression. Touchy-feely, 69, even holding hands. That body's just lying there. But it has what it takes to make me happy. The cold, the aura of death, the smell of death, the funeral surroundings, it all contributes. The smell of death. Sure. I find the odor of death very erotic. There are death odors, and then there are death odors. Now, you get your body that's been floating in the bay for two weeks or a burn victim. That doesn't attract me much, but a freshly embalmed corpse is something else. There is also this attraction to blood. When you're on top of a body... It tends to purge blood out of its mouth while you're making passionate love. You'd have to be there, I guess. Of course, with all the AIDS going around. That's the reason I haven't tried anything lately. I'm sure I'd have found a way to get into one of those funeral homes by now. But the group I find attractive, young men in their 20s, are the ones who are dying of AIDS. Did you usually attend the funerals of your corpse lovers? Yeah. It was convenient working in the funeral homes. I'd get to drive out to the cemetery with the family. I'd get to mourn right along with the family at the loss of that loved one. Except I was groaning in a little different tone. People can't really tell if you're grief-stricken or passion-stricken. I've had members of the family put their arms around me and say, We're so glad you could come. Then you have to spin this big ol' yarn. Yeah, I knew him in school. 
if the guy didn't have a girlfriend in life, they'd think, oh, she's the one. You weren't in Sacramento at the time of the trial, were you? No. I was working in a funeral home in another city and going to school at the same time. It's weird, but the day I got a telegram about the trial telling me to get in touch with my attorney, I went into the funeral home and was fired for things I had done at that funeral home. Somebody, I guess, got wise of me. I know I wasn't seen, but I think someone just figured it out. Of course, they didn't know about Sacramento yet. They found out later. The same day, within five hours of each other, two totally different things caught up with me. I worked in the funeral home for almost a year. That's where I did a lot of my extracurricular activities. I had keys, so I'd slip back in after hours and spend all night there. A guy lived at the funeral home in an apartment downstairs. He drank, so he usually passed out. He had a three fifty seven Magnum under his pillow. That guy that court case was about? John McCure. Yeah. I understand he I understand he was moved out of the cemetery after the trial. That happened at the time I was breaking into these funeral homes. There was a side room, one of those arrangement areas, where they always have their case folders out. I read there was an exhumation order for John McCure. Then I read something in the paper about it. His mother wanted the body exhumed, said she wouldn't bury her cat there. On the day he was supposed to be exhumed, I snuck out into a field across from where he was buried. I sat in the field and watched him dig up the body and give him to this other mortician. They shipped them back to Michigan. When did you first become aware of your necrophilia? It's something I've been attracted to all my life. I used to hold funeral services for my pets when they died. I had a little pet graveyard. I lived in a small town, and the fireman's barbecue was next door to the funeral home. To go to the bathroom, you had to use the facilities in the funeral home. I'd find any excuse I could to go to the bathroom. Then I'd take side trips and wander around the mortuary. It didn't scare you like the other kids? No, I loved it. I was real curious. I'd wander around the halls. Do you miss working in funeral homes? Yes, terribly. Even if I wasn't a necrophile, I like mortuary work. I enjoy embalming and everything, except for obese people. The bodies I hated working on most were obese people. Especially if they'd been autopsied. Their guts would slide out on the floor and shit. And all this melty fat. Yuck. You said something previously about the vampire killer. Richard Trenton Chase. He was from Sacramento, wasn't he? Yeah. The second funeral home I worked for, I wasn't working there at the time, got the bodies of Chase's victims, a man and a woman and their child, so I heard the gory details of what the bodies looked like. They were really butchered. They were disemboweled with shit stuffed in their mouths. Chase started by killing animals and drinking their blood, and when he wasn't satisfied with that, he graduated to people. He killed this couple, then kidnapped their child, killed it, and later threw it in a trash can. The mortician who embalmed the body said he hardly ever got queasy about anything, but he got sick when he saw those bodies. What's the weirdest case that you've ever encountered? Mm, there was one kid who fell out of a car while his mother was making a turn, and she managed to run over his head. Another kid choked to death on a cigarette wrapper. One guy committed suicide by shooting himself in the head with a pellet rifle. He had to shoot himself several times, and it took him a while to die. But he finally succeeded. There was another guy I worked on. He was a transvestite who somehow strangled himself with his nylons. I don't think it was intentional. I think he was trying to achieve heightened orgasm through strangulation. And he ended up hanging himself. He wouldn't be the first to make that mistake. How about the most unusual funeral? One time, this bunch of religious fanatics held a funeral for one of the members. They didn't want her embalmed. They just wanted her dressed and in the casket. We usually didn't do that, but we decided to be nice and put her up in the stateroom. We were standing outside of that stateroom and we heard someone saying, Rise in the name of Jesus. They were praying and slapping the body. They were talking in tongues. That was weird. 
There seems to be a strong camaraderie between morticians, almost like a secret society. Very much so. Morticians are very tight with each other because most people won't have anything to do with them. I used to find if I went to a party, I'd always be introduced like, this is Karen and she's a mortician. But they don't say, here's Karen, she's a secretary, or she's a veterinary assistant. A lot of people are under the misconception that morticians are very straight, very somber. If they ever went back into the prep room and heard all the jokes that are cracked, it would blow that theory right out of the window. Did any of those morticians ever testify for or against you at the trial? One funeral director testified on behalf of funeral practices. He was asked how often necrophilia occurs. He said it's almost unheard of in this profession. That's a major lie. Yes, definitely. Necrophilia is more prevalent than most people can imagine. Funeral homes just don't report it. There was one place that I broke into, and I know that they definitely knew something was wrong. They actually caught me in the act and let me get away. At another place I was working, this guy came up to me and said, Someone's been messing with the body. It looks like they were trying to fuck the body. I said, oh my goodness, really? I think they figured it out later. I know they know now. One mortician I worked with used to like to get a choker, which is a large hollow needle used to suction fluids from corpses, and push it up inside any male cadaver's dick. He'd say, oh look, the corpse got a boner. This guy was really weird. He looked like Larry of the Three Stooges. I think he had some necrophilic tendencies. He'd get real upset if there weren't any female bodies to work on. He'd start pacing. I caught him one time in the prep room. He said he was just taking a pee in the hopper at the end of the table. He was just pulling up his pants when I walked in and I said, I won't tell if you don't. You say you were once caught in the act of necrophilia. Yeah, I tried to kill myself again. And was living in a halfway house a couple of blocks up from this funeral home. I decided to go to the mausoleum and try to kill myself again. The mausoleum had a door connecting it to the mortuary. I was sitting in there, real depressed, when, just for the hell of it, I decided to try running my driver's license along the edge of the door and click, the door popped open. I couldn't believe it, so I tried it again, and the door popped open again. I went into the prep room, and there happened to be a body in there. I had me some fun, did my thing, and forgot all about killing myself. I told the folks at the halfway house that I stayed the night with friends. I went in there several times. Sometimes there were absolutely no bodies, so I turned around and snuck back out. I usually went in the back door. About a week later, I snuck back into the funeral home. I was on the prep table, having a good old time when all of a sudden I felt like there was somebody nearby. Next thing, I heard people walking down the hallway. I quietly jumped off the table and threw the sheet back over the body. My clothes were in quite a state of disarray, and I had blood on me and everything else. It had been an autopsy case. There was a casket with the lid open in the side casket room, so I ran and hid behind it. The casket was on a church truck, so they couldn't see me, but they could see my legs. It was a man and a woman. They were standing there saying, Who are you? What are you doing here? One of them said to the other, You go get the gun and call the cops and I'll stay down here. I knew I only had one chance then, so I busted out and ran. I knew the layout of the place, so I just ran down the hall and out the place and out the cemetery. At the time, I still had a friend who worked at the funeral home. He said, Somebody broke into the funeral home. They know it was you. They put in an alarm after that. I think they called the police, but there were never any charges. I'm sure they didn't want the publicity. That was the last time I got very close. Except for, I've broken into a few tombs. Have you seen any changes in people's attitudes toward necrophilia? Yeah. When I came out here, I noticed it. It's almost a fad. They're not really necrophiles, but pseudo-necrophiles, like a death cult. But there are probably a lot of people who would do it if they had the opportunity. Perhaps there is this vast network of necrophiles who, for lack of a forum, will never know of each other's existence. Well, there's Layla's group. 
American Association of Nephrophilic Research and Enlightenment, they try and get some information out about it. It must be frustrating when people say, we have to cure you, or you've got to be more like us. It is. For a while, I found myself thinking, yeah, this isn't normal. Why can't I be like other people? Why doesn't the same pair of shoes fit me just right? I went through all the personal hell, and finally, I accepted myself and realized that's just me. That's my nature. I might as well enjoy it. I'm miserable when I try to be something I'm not. And to a lot of these people who are putting me down have hang-ups worse than I have, or they do things that might be considered questionable by their peers. I had a gay friend who, when he found out I was a necrophile, said, you can go to hell for that. After 1979, when I was put on probation, part of the probation requirement was that I seek therapy. I had a really nice social worker. She was cool, very non-judgmental. The more I talked to these people, the more I realized necrophilia makes sense for me. The reason I was having a problem with it was because I couldn't accept myself. I was still trying to live my life by other people's standards. To accept it was peace. These people who are always trying to change me only help me get myself more in touch with my feelings. I used to go from the therapist's office to the funeral homes. It didn't work, folks. Wow. So, after this interview, uh, Miss Karen Greenlee, a few years later, or actually, I don't even think it was a few years later, <clears throat> I think it was after the, this was published, she regretted the interview. I guess she was like, well, I mean, it's out there. People are going to know who I am, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, people ain't going to hire me <laughs> to uh, do... Especially as a fucking yeah. mortician. <laughs> yeah. So she ended up changing her name and started moving around. If we know anything about Greenlee is that she's probably broken into a morgue at this moment and is probably having a, having sex with a body right now. I mean, if she changed her name, maybe she managed to get a little bit um, more discreet. Maybe she got herself like a solid job or opened her own funeral home. Yeah, maybe. So that's it? Like she just kind of disappeared? That's it. Wow. What an interesting story. <laughs> what an odd story. And she didn't like kill anybody. Well, I suppose she stole that body though, didn't she? But she actually was in love with these bodies. Yeah. That's so Well, I strange. mean, it's, it's not, she didn't kill anybody, but this is Weekly Creep. And we love talking about shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> but she did steal a dead body. Yeah. At least one. Yeah. That's insane. And she, like, she admitted, like, while she had it within her possession, she was yeah, doing things. Doing it. Doing her thing. Well, that was... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Family, well, family annihilators and necrophiles. Well, that was... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gang. Um, we'll probably get back into something more, a little more paranormal next week. Maybe I don't know if I want to kick this necrophile spree like streak thing that I got going on right now. Let us know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're listening to this still, and you have any spooky stories of your own, strange encounters, anything like that that you feel you would like for us to read out, got a friend on... who likes to fuck dead bodies. Yeah, maybe don't tell us about that. Tell the police. Um, but yeah, send your stories to weeklycreep at gmail.com. And because our next titillating tales of true terror will be out on the 1st of June. The 1st of June. Can you freaking believe it? Yes. Insane. Yes, time goes on. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever the fuck you want. YouTube. Write us a review. Yeah, if you've listened to us on Apple Podcasts, make sure to rate and review. If we you just like a... us, if you don't, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just got a lovely review from Abu Dhabi. 
Yeah. Definitely our first one from that neck of the woods. So that was lovely. So far. I was like, where is this place? And I saw it on the map and I was like, whoa, that's far. Yeah. Yeah. That's so crazy. So, yeah, I guess that's it, guys. Thank we, you for listening. We're in someone's pair of headphones that far away. How wild is yeah. that? India and everything. It's and they, crazy. they don't even know who we are. Well, they do now. Yeah, but they I don't... like to think that anybody who listens to this is our friend, you know? Yeah. That's true. Anyway, you can if you want more content, feel free to join <laughs> our Patreon. We have been publishing more than not. There's a buttload of stuff up on there for you and a buttload more coming. Yeah. We've been really good with the extra content. Like we were hoping. Yeah. So and it's fun for us too. So yeah, I think that's it. Kind of dragging this out a bit now yeah so see you guys on monday no see you guys on tuesday for titillating tales of true terror and see you guys next friday for the regular show okay bye bye i feel like every fucking car with a big fucking dumb exhaust just decided to roll up <laughs> you're in your stupid exhaust yeah. <laughs> who are you who are you trying to prove to <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha